Hello. My name is Leo Johnson. I head up PwC's disruption team. Um, I also moonlight doing a Radio 4 program called Future Proofing about the stuff that's coming down the track 5, 10, 15 years ahead. This program, by the way, is normally on Wednesdays at 8 p.m., which is the same time as Bake Off. Okay. So no one actually listens to this program. Let me be, be, get that established early on. But what I'd like to talk about, oh, by the way, is it OK, is it okay if I don't talk about Brexit? <laughs> Can we just park that? Can we just park that briefly? In fact, even about politics more broadly, can we just park that for a moment and instead talk about tech, innovation, and what its links are to business and society, what some of the dreams can be? What I'd love to do is throw out four different glimpses of different possible futures. We've all of us got a future in our head. To each of us, I think, it's in a way the official future. It's the thing we bank on, the thing we plan around. And my hunch is that there's some stuff getting cooked up. And for each of us, the official future is quite probably rooted in the present and the past and extrapolating forward from that. But there are four different alternative futures to the official future, which are probably going to take a lot of us by surprise. And some of them are going to be real challenges, and some of them radically worse. But I think there's at least one of them that's radically better. And what I'd love to do is throw out these scenarios. Let me just get a sounding from the room. There's a whole load of hype around unicorns. The 2010s have been the decade of the unicorns, where these billion-dollar-plus tech-valued companies, this fictional beast became reality, and suddenly we had this stampede of the unicorns across the landscape of business, 250 of them right now. Is any of this stuff real? And what's it going to do short-term and long-term? So let me just get the mood of the room. Take an innovation like driverless cars. Is it actually going to happen? Just call out yes if you think it's going to happen. Driverless cars, is it going to happen? Yes. OK, let's push this a bit further. Stuff like the Elon Musk, you know, pod in a tunnel, London to Edinburgh in 41 minutes, Dubai to Abu Dhabi in 12 minutes, the Hyperloop. Could that possibly happen? OK, they can't break at the moment. They can't turn either. Apart from that, the technology is looking, looking good. Let's push it further. Um, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, the projections for Uber, Elevate, and NASA, essentially not just drones, but passenger taking drones. Could that happen? I'm hearing, I'm hearing some yes. OK, what about synthetic? biology revolutions that could really start to increase the age we live to. Could that happen? Yes. Yeah, you talk to Sarah Harper. She says, there's already kids alive today. Maybe one of our kids who will live to 150. Talk to Aubrey de Grey, who I talk to often on this stuff. He says, that's ridiculous, because that's way too low. That's way, way too low. The seven deadly things that routinely kill us. And we're like the giant redwood trees in California. We're just going to be able to improve our root system so we don't fall over. Improve the tan in our bark so we ward off the mosquitoes. And we're essentially going to go on, keep on, keeping on. OK, what I'd like to do is roll out four different scenarios based on two separate levers. And can we put the slide up, please? And what I propose is that there's Two critical questions that are going to determine how our businesses thrive or not. And the first is, what's the level of innovation? So we've grown up in the city of Henry Ford, the city of fossil fuel-driven mass production that rocked, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Are we moving towards a new general purpose technology, towards a new wave of innovation that's based on exponential technology, on data, on the algorithm? Are we moving? towards not just a set of innovative technologies, but towards the deployment of it. This is the second lever. That is centralized. 
This is the second critical question. If there is this new set, this new arsenal of technology, who's the winners? Who owns it? Is the power, economic and political, going to be concentrated into the hands of a few platform companies and countries, or is it going to be distributed? And if you take those two levers, what I think you get is four very different flavors of the world. So let's start with the uh, top right, rise of the machines scenario. I got into a driverless car about a year back for the Radio 4 program in Singapore. And this car, it was terrific. It drove about 250 meters, super smooth, super easy, and then it started to swerve purposefully onto the wrong side of the road in front of a giant dumpster truck coming our way on the dual carriageway. The emergency driver yanks the wheel, gets us back to safety. Then he says, OK, that didn't go that well. But he said, you've got to understand, Leo, this is not a plain vanilla driverless car. This is a do-it-yourself driverless car. To which I said, OK, thanks for letting me know that. This is built with off-the-shelf supermarket technology for about 7,000 bucks. You could put it on your own car, infrastructure neutral, doesn't need anything laid out. And they're just trying to get it rolled out as fast as they can. But what is interesting is what happened next. And what happened next is we went back to the Ministry of Transport. And it turns out it's the Ministry of Transport that's writing the city plan, essentially, for Singapore. And he said, this is the sequence of events that's going to unfold. Step one, driverless cars, which will then be followed by cars that can elevate, just like NASA and Uber Elevate, a multimodal transport system. Step two, to fully automate the economy. Put all citizens as step three on universal basic incomes, because there will not be the jobs. And step four, then to close the city walls to migra uh, migration, because you've got northern Jakarta quietly going underwater from climate change. And as the ministry said, this will be too socially complex. So what you've got is the ripples from the technological into the economic, into the social, into the political. And that is one glimpse into a possible scenario, a possible deployment of tech that we could have. And the question is, OK, what then follows for business and society? And what we project is that if we do have that highly innovative but centralized, top right deployment of tech, it doesn't end there. There are then some ripples. And what you see is a possible move into another scenario. If you're not the tech leader, some impacts on other business models and countries. And this is the global rationing scenario. So let's take a look at what we see as the direct and indirect impacts that may start to emerge. Take the British motorway system, that jewel in the crown of our daily lives, the motorway service station. What are driverless trucks going to do? Well, just the trucks for one group we looked at over 10 years, if they go driverless, that 300 million off their balance sheets. Take airports. How do airports make money? How do airports make money? Parking, Toblerone, that's it. Right? That's the business model, OK? The parking, 20% of the revenue from driverless cars. That's before 3D printing as well, which is 41% of air cargo that's in the quadrant, that's low value to bulk and 3D printable, TAT in other words. Put those two together, 11 out of 13 UK airports, they start losing money. You've got ports. You go down to a British port, what's one of the critical decisions they've got to make right now? Forget Brexit. We're doubling the processing time from two to four, creates a 17-mile tailback. That's priority number two. Priority number one, do you spend 150 million quid to upgrade the docks or not? And what's the critical uncertainty? Are drones going to get good enough to do offshore loading and unloading, completely stranding the asset you just put 150 million in within the next five years? You've got sector after sector where there's these direct bites, which tech can remove from business as usual, your clients, all of our clients, your companies, 
But there's also, I think, a second order of effect that could make this second scenario complex to navigate. And what is this? This is, we're all going to be victims of our success. Because what was our success built on? It was built on efficiency. It was built on Fordist, Henry Ford's economic models, high volume, low margin businesses, all based around efficiency. Economies of scale. Get the numbers up, hit the break even, pump up the volumes, and then everything's looking good. But if you've got an economic model where suddenly tech is starting to eat away at jobs, and Frey and Osborne's projection is for 47% of US and UK white collar jobs under this centralized deployment of AI to be eliminated by 2035. 47%, by the way, that is half this room. That is this side of the room, you're all fine, okay? This side of the room, you're gone. You're gone by 2035. This is the Frey and Osborne projection. If that's the case, then what happens to mainstream business models whose lifeblood is consumer demand? And what we look at is a number of sectors where actually the margins are quite thin. So you take the short haul flight for your Easter holiday from Luton to Barcelona. What's the average profit that flight might make? Is it less than 20,000 or more than 20,000? Less or more? It's less. It's about 600 quid profit per flight. That's three of us deciding not to go for it not to make money. If you take the banking system, the top 5% of a UK high street bank, the white collar top 5% of clients, what proportion of the total profits do they contribute? Is it more or less than 100%? I know that sounds like a trick question, okay? It's more than 100%, it's 150% because the long tail is loss making. They're propped up by the wealthy white collar. And if that white collar gets decimated, there's a problem for the model. Okay, what is the point with this? You've got some vulnerabilities. If we go the centralized deployment, where we're trying to put in technology at the expense of human intelligence and of jobs, there is a risk. There is a risk that we start to do stuff to the central pillars of the economy. But where does this start to lead for government? I think there's some interesting challenges. You look at the national balance sheet, two things go wrong. One is you get less income in, less business rates, less corporate tax, less income tax, less VAT. Two is on the national balance sheet again. You get more costs. You get more welfare costs, more unemployment costs, more adult social care costs, more child costs. And that's on top of a system that's already struggling to deal with pensions. By the way, let's not talk about pensions either. Does anyone think they have a pension? I will park that for the moment. You talk to some of the projections, the actuaries around the risks of what exponential medicine could do to tech. We looked at one group, it was a 40% increase in their liabilities. We've got a system that's already broken. By the way, we're all of us doing much better than Russia, for example, where in Russia the pension age is now six years after the average life expectancy, just to cheer you up. So as long as you work six years after you die, you're fine, okay? You get a pretty decent pension. It's not enough to live on, but you're okay. Um, all right, what is the point here? If that starts to happen to the national balance sheet, then the stuff we're having to digest at the moment politically, it's a weak signal of something more serious to come. What you'll start to see is a recognition that you will have an economic model that is not working for the many. And you'll have a momentum behind challenger political movements that are questioning the incumbent approaches of political parties. And we know what those challenger movements have a tendency to look like. One of them is populism of the left, the other is populism of the right. And the problem is that both of those have got doom loops baked into them. And this is where we see that there could potentially be a third scenario. And I've been told to be really sort of cheerful and uplifting. So let me take you into this third scenario where, where things get a little bit darker, okay? And this third scenario, the survival of the fittest, is where we actually start to move backwards in terms of GDP and even in terms of the technological base. What does it look like? Well, populism of the left. If the model is spend, spend, spend your way out of austerity, blow the budget, get the deficit out there, we know 
the bond markets punish it. We know the bond markets price that date debt to unsustainable levels. If the measure is populism of the right, protect your way out of austerity. Well, then what we also know is that there is this potential death waltz, this toxic tango between job loss and protectionism, where the more you have job losses, the more political pressure there is protectionism, the more that creates the slowdown of economic activity. As we've seen in the UK already, that creates more job loss. So layer that spiral with some of the external megatrends, including climate change among them. The World Bank, where I used to work, projects 140 million climate refugees by 2040. Lace those together. There is a scenario where some of the open borders, some of the just-in-time trade, some of the free movement of goods and people that we've come to take for granted, and indeed the political liberalism that we've taken for granted, looks challenging. And you see an increasingly unequal, increasingly insecure, increasingly unstable type of economy. How is the US, by the way, teaching navigation right now, once again, back on the syllabus? What's the technology they're using? The stars, celestial navigation, the one technology that they know cannot be hacked, for the moment, that is, OK? You've got the potential for a regression. But I think there is also the potential for something radically different. Technology, we know this, is not the answer. It is the amplifier of intent. And the question is, what do we want to do? We are at this moment where it is not black swans we are facing. It is black elephants in the room of the economic, social, and environmental challenges. And the question is, do we want to deploy tech to address them and create a model of growth that's underpinned by solving those problems of the many. And this is where I think there is a fourth scenario that's not just possible, but credible, and even the dominant, the dominant possible scenario for the future. And what does that look like? Well, just take one example, the hardest nut you could possibly crack. Take the 1.4 billion people in the world who don't have any power. They're powerless because they've got no power. Then take a very simple tech play, which is the solar light, useless if you don't have power because you can't afford to buy it. But suddenly, with an Internet of Things play, put a SIM card in it, make it asset financeable. Remotely, you can turn it on and off. It means no one can nick it. Suddenly, you can lease it for 50 or 60 cents a day to the poorest of the poor, way less than they're spending on kerosene or firewood. Gets rid of all the health impacts. With that, they got microbanking. They got microinsurance with weather-based payouts if there's floods or droughts. They can get the kickstart hand pump that triples the number of crops they can provide, gets them access to the underground water table, gets incomes up in one study from $180 to $1,800 a head. Exam pass rates up from 58 to 83%. What you've got there is a vision of the deployment of tech that's got a 10x baked into it. It's taking incomes up by increasing productivity, $1,800. From, 80, from 180, and also 10x, because the market it's addressing is not just the shrinking market of the urban and suburban affluent billion, it's what will by then be the whole 10 billion. You've got a revolution in tech that is happening, away from mass production, which depended on these high capex, centralized, factory-based models of productivity, to a model of innovation where suddenly the barriers to innovating have, as we know, dropped. And of course, it's cloud, and it's open data, and it's APIs, and it's microprinting, and it's micromanufacturing. But what we've seen suddenly, the costs aren't zero. They're still there. But the costs of acquiring, the costs of using, the costs of innovating, the costs of becoming a successful challenger have dropped. There's potentially a new age of empowerment that is available. And it's challenger individuals who are getting unlocked. And this might be Sophie Power, the marathon runner, realizing that the air quality in her car is 20 times worse than it's out on the street, and hacking her way into the air bubble filter that removes 94% of pollutants. It might be Edward Higgins, who took down Novichuk, the Salisbury poisoners. 
It wasn't MI6. It was Higgins, a guy in his pajamas with access to Wi-Fi and three databases, Moscow medals, flight recognition technology, and flight records, face recognition and flight records. It's these innovators coming up with $30 DIY insulin pumps, $500 DIY pancreases, who are using these tools to create new, new value. It's the innovator teams as well, whether it's Airbnb for nurses and teachers in uh, the Netherlands, partnering them up with pensioners who've got free room, whether it's Michelin, realizing that the truckers have got an immense need for fuel efficiency, doing an Internet of Things play there, saving $1,300 per truck per year through a fuel efficiency Internet of Things play. What we've got is a series of innovators within companies, across companies, who are using these tools to unlock new sets of value. What is the choice we've got? It's about what we are trying to solve with tech. There is a quote which I will end with from that great political philosopher, Marilyn Monroe. And she says the following, sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fall into place. Where are we now? We are at a Marilyn moment. We're at a moment where we're having a generational shift in technologies. And we choose what problems we want to solve with those technologies. And our central choice is, what do we value? And if we value the people and places around us, if we value the intelligence, the talent of those whom we work with and the citizens around the globe, then I think we've got a unique chance to take these tools, to deploy them with one core goal, which is to unlock that talent, to unlock that giant asset of the cognitive surplus of all the innovators in your teams, in your partners, and to use that tech to deliver on something that's not just as good as the official future that we've all got in our heads, but actually way better. And on that note, thank you very much for having me.